Good evening, everyone. You're watching Vintage Motocross Q&A, and I'm your host, Joe Abadi. On tonight's show, in tonight's segment of Next Time Try This, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how to mount a fender when you have your triple clamp in place on your bike. In the Moto Showcase, we'll be taking a look at a 1968 Penton that's still owned by the original owner. In the Here's the Problem segment, I'll tell you a little bit more about how to fix a problem a lot of guys are having on Can-Ams with a downpipe. In the What's It Work segment, Bill Mascio will be back with me. We'll be talking a little bit more about this Yamaha that recently sold on eBay for $5,900. You're not going to want to miss the next segment of the 522 project. Tonight, we're going to be talking about the swing arm, some of the modifications we made there to help this project look as original as possible. Right now, if you can, I'd like you to share the show, whether you're on your computer or on your phone, reach down, hit that share button at the end of the show tonight. Susie will be in with a random winner and we're going to be giving away this miracle wash from Amsoil. This is really, really good stuff. Whether you're out trail riding or you have a street bike, no matter what you have, if you get a little dirt, a little dust on your equipment, on your bike, you could wipe it all down. You could follow up with this and a soft cloth makes it look like it uh, was just detailed. Really great product from Amsoil. So hit the share button and we'll see to it that somebody gets a can of that a little bit later on in the show. Also, the YouTube channel is growing. It's growing slowly, but it's growing surely. I'd like you to go over there after the show tonight, share, uh, share the YouTube information with people, subscribe. It's free, it's fast, it's fun. You can see all the videos that we've made here on Vintage Motocross Q&A, and you can watch them in HD, from your television. So please subscribe to our YouTube channel. I want to thank our sponsors, Preston Petty Products, Vinco, Amsoil, and of course, fastguystuff.com. Next time, try this. On tonight, next time, try this. I'm going to tell you a little bit about how to mount a fender on the front of your bike. I think you're going to find this very, very interesting. Jordan, let's see what we got. The best and most accurate way to drill a fender that you're starting to put on a bike if it's brand new is to have the old fender there. If you have it, you can lay that fender on top of the new one and you can take a look at it from front to back and on the sides. Make sure everything's lined up and with a marker, you can mark where the holes go and you know they're going to be correct because you've taken it off the original fender. But we don't always have that luxury. So how do we get our holes exactly where they have to be when the triple clamp is still on the bike and you have no way to get underneath there to measure it. I'm going to show you how to do that right now. So if you can't get a good mark because your, swing, your, your triple clamp is, of course, on the bike and you can't get in there with the forks, what you're going to do is you could take two screws or four screws just like this. Put them up there under the triple clamp. Take a piece of wire like this. And make sure it's thin wire, not wire that's, that's too thick. Because what you're going to do is put a pair of pliers on it like this. And keeping it flat down there, you're going to tighten it up just like this. Till you got four sort of corners just like that. You take it off. And you're going to have a piece just like this, okay, or like this. You're then going to take that and you're going to put it on your fender and it's going to give you an idea of where your holes are going to go and I'm going to show you how to do that. Now you have your fender which hasn't been drilled yet and you don't really have an idea of exactly where your holes are going to go. You could take the piece that you've made from your triple clamp and you could carefully put it and you can measure if you have to measure or move it where you have to move it. You could put it there on top of your fender. Maybe tape it down once you have an idea of where exactly you want to make your holes, okay? And from there, you could take a marker and in each corner of that wire, you could put a little mark. Now, those screws that I happened to be using there were six millimeter, that marker, I mean, if you were going to make it exact, exact, perfect, you'd have to come in like three millimeters. But with a marker, much like you see here, if it's got a little bit of a thick, thick point to it, if you 
just go right there where that wire begins to curve. You'll be in just about where you have to go. Also, if you'd like, when you're done with that, you can now go back to your bike and take a look on the triple clamp, you know, put the fender up under the bike and see how close you are, and you should be exceptionally close, to where your holes would be that you're going to be drilling in there. Something else I wanted to bring to your attention. Once you have that fender and you have it, you have it marked where you have your holes. What I would do is I would take a drill about six millimeters, okay? Same size as the bolt you're gonna put in there and drill the holes once you know it's exactly where you want it on the bike. When you drill those holes, take your six millimeter screws, not necessarily the bolt you're gonna be putting back into that triple clamp because then you have, of course, the, uh, you have, of course, the, uh, the washer and, and the, uh, the grommet. You can put your screws through there and you can put it up and see on the bike that everything lines up. If one of them happened to be off a little bit, you've only drilled a six millimeter hole in there. You can still make a little alteration for that. And if you have to move your fender a little bit to the front or a little bit more to the back, you can do that because you're gonna be using a step up drill to make that hole bigger in order to accept your grommets. But at that point with those four six millimeter holes in there, you'll be able to put the four screws up and see that your fender lines up exactly with the triple clamps. I hope you enjoyed that. And remember, it's an easy way to do that when you can't get underneath there uh, to, to measure exactly, because there is no way to measure exactly how to get your fender just exactly where it has to go underneath the triple clamp. In the Moto Showcase, we have a bike that was sent in to us by a gentleman named John Bourne. This happens to be a very, very interesting piece. It's a 1968 Penton 125 six-day replica. I'm gonna to read to you a little bit about this bike while Jordan goes through the slides from John Bourne. Hi, Joe. Here are a few pictures. The pictures of the man on this Penton is my father, Al, in Dalton, Georgia. This was for the Stone Mountain National Enduro. This is two days after the first shipment of Penton motorcycles were sent to Amherst, Ohio. The picture of the receipt is the original receipt from the bike. If you look at the initials on the bottom of that receipt, you'll see it says John A. Penton. The bike was used in hair scrambles, enduros, and motocross. He raced it in the 125 support class in the 1968 Inner Am motocross in New Philadelphia, Ohio. It was restored in 1999. I'm aware that the clutch cable isn't correct. I do have the new one. I just have to get it put on the bike. And that's from our friend, John Bourne. I love a story like this where a guy has purchased a bike in 1968. It gets passed down to the sun. And here we see it right here. Penton, six-day trials replica, a favorite of so many guys, especially in the Ohio area where Penton was so prominent. John, I want to thank you for sending in this bike to us and the pictures. In turn, I want to send you a sticker pack from fastguystuff.com. So send me your address and I'll get you out those stickers right away. John, once again, Thanks so much for sending in that very special bike. Here's the problem. You send in some questions during the week. I do my best to come up with some answers for those problems. And the first one tonight that we have, Jordan, is Robert Oscar Pomeroy. I need to repack this Can-Am pipe with silencer material. The baffle came loose and I got it out, but I can't get back in there. How should I approach removing this end of the piece of this pipe in order to get back in there. Next slide, Jordan. Here's the pipe on the Can-Am, kind of like a bazooka thing going on there. It's pretty big, but there really is no way to get inside that pipe. It doesn't come like other pipes where there are screws at the backs with a cap. So to get back in there, you've got to do something a little bit more involved. If you look on the slide here, you'll see that there's a weld where it's ahead of where it kind of tapers down at the back. Oscar, here's what you have to do. You have to get that weld off in order to get in there. The way you're going to do that is with something like this. It's called a cutoff wheel, and you're going to use it on a die grinder, okay? What I would recommend is you sand off that weld just a little bit, just enough to get the paint off, make it a little flat if you can, just around there. Then slowly, with your die grinder, make a line around it very, very slowly. Go a little bit at a time. When you order discs for your grinder, for your uh, die grinder, your, your cutoff wheels, 
Look at them. They come in sizes. You want to get one as thin as possible, and you're going to slice that weld right in half. Now, hear me out. When you go to slice that weld, just take it a little bit at a time. You don't want to go right through that thing and cut right through the pipe, and here's why. I believe that's a slip fit. That cone that's on the end of your pipe is a slip fit into the bigger end of the pipe, the main section of your exhaust, and then it's welded around. You don't want to cut all the way through that. Just cut through it to break the weld, and that cone shape that's on the back, along with the baffle, should come out. When you get that out, the baffle is going to be connected to that cone on the back. You'll be able to wrap it with some new fiberglass wrap. I think we have a slide picture of it right here. Here it is. You'll be able to pack that pipe again, put it back together, and have your welder put a nice bead around there. Again, get the thinnest cutoff disc as possible. Be very, very patient when you cut around that weld. You don't want to cut all the way through because, I, as I said, that baffle, I think it's a slip fit with that cone and that baffle going down into the, to the main section of that pipe. Robert Oscar Pomeroy, thanks for the question. I appreciate it. I hope that shed some light on the problem for you. Jim Byrne, I actually found this question interesting. Jim didn't send it in directly, but I found it on the Motorcycle Gas Tank Q&A page. So I added it to the show tonight, and I'm going to share it with you folks. I'm having difficulty matching the paint on my Suzuki TM250. I ordered guaranteed match touch-up paint. It didn't match. I discovered that these online suppliers look up similar match and send you that. How do I get an exact match? Not a close match, the exact match. The best way to do this, Jim, is to take a new piece of plastic or your gas tank, if it's still clean on the bottom and it has the original color, and take it down to an auto body supply shop in your town. They're going to scan it. They do it with uh, a little, I'll, there's a picture of it right here. Jordan will bring it up. There's like a scanner, okay? Looks like a thing they scan in a supermarket when they're, when they're checking prices. And they run it over that paint and it gives them an exact match. In that picture, you could see where I have my own CR green matched up. After they take that profit, it's going to come out exactly how much of each color goes into that mixture to give you the exact color that you want. So that's the way to get a perfect match. Take your piece down to an auto body supplier, have them do a scan on it. It's going to come back. They're going to give you a formula just like that, guaranteed to match any piece of plastic or metal that you bring in there that has a good quality color on it. Hope that was of some help to you, Jim. Robert Curie, will chroming a pair of chromoly handlebars weaken them? Most that I see are black. Chrome will not weaken chromoly. I've had chromoly bars rechromed before. And uh, maybe contrary to popular belief, there isn't some bubbling cauldron of chrome that's 5 million degrees that you dunk the bars in and they come out all shiny. It's, it's not even that hot. It, it's like not even 100 degrees. There are different processes to that. There's a copper finish, there's a nickel finish, then there's the chrome, then there's the polishing. The amount of heat that comes out of those, those mixtures, out of those batches and those vats is nowhere near as hot as one might think. No, it is not gonna affect the, uh, the, the, the strength of the chromoly on those bars. Something else to think about. Think about guys with the BMX bikes and the mountain bikes. Um, they have chromoly frames. Many of them are aluminum, but many of them are chromoly. Many of them are nickel, some of them are chrome, all of them have to be dipped in that batch and then polished in order to get them to get, get them to shine like that. And if it doesn't affect those bikes and how much of a beating they take, it's not going to affect a set of handlebars. Robert Curie, thanks for the question. 1978 YZ250. It was sold this week for $5,900 on eBay. And I had a conversation with my friend Bill Masho about that. We're going to bring you the video right now. So you can hear what Bill and I had to say. Jordan? Bill, when I first looked at this bike and I saw the price of $5,900, um, I thought it was a really good deal. And I was surprised when I looked closer at the pictures that it was as nice as it was. The first thing that stood out to me was the hardware. It didn't look like it was refinished, which sometimes I go toward, well, you restored a bike, but you didn't refinish the hardware. But when I looked at it, it looked so perfect. It looked so original. You know, it, it, you could obviously tell that it wasn't refinished, but it looked so original. Yeah, I think uh, the hardware did stand out as being a high point of, of the bike. Um, I couldn't really tell if it was refinished or original, but 
in either case, it, you know, really looks extremely good, much better than many bikes that you'll see mm -hmm. out there. So uh, that worked really well for me. On the other hand, what didn't work for me was the mismatch of colors between the gas tank and the other bodywork, uh, the mm -hmm. side panels and the fenders. And yellow is a difficult color to work with, but um, it really does stand out and, and doesn't quite stand up to the description of the bike as being museum quality. I think you'd have to go another step beyond yeah. that with the finishes to, to get to that point. When you mentioned the yellow and the plastic, another thing that I thought was a plus was, although the shade was a bit off, was the fact that the bike's gas tank wasn't yellowed and that the graphics on it were not the perforated graphics that you normally see. So I, I thought that was a plus. And although I can't quite tell from the picture, it appears that the swing arm had uh, anodizing on it, not silver paint like you often see on a restoration. Yeah, that was that was really hard to discern. Um, it could be paint, could be anodized. It looks really good regardless. Mm -hmm. I think um, if this bike was shown at a judged event, there it wouldn't lose any points for for the swing arm finish either either way, whether it's painted or anodized. And um, you know the tank decals, I think show a little tiredness to it mm -hmm. and perhaps uh, they could have been freshened up and then with my previous thought about the the shade of color i would have probably taken these fenders and side panels and painted them to match the tank now plastic normally doesn't get painted but in this case you'd have to do that to get yeah. a really good match in those shades of yellow and i think that would really help the bike but in terms of valuation you know, it's pretty solid here at uh, 5900 bucks. Uh, it could stand for some more vintage, correct-looking tires on it um, and a few other little tiny details that could be improved upon. But overall, good, solid bike. The only thing, if I had to nitpick at it, was I saw a little a little crease in the silencer. Which you I know that see, as well, yeah. You know, which you can only see in a couple of pictures. So, but again, I, I don't think that detracts from the bike too much. Another thing I did like about the bike were the rims. Uh, I didn't see any tire iron marks. I didn't see any gouges, scrapes, or anything that detracted from the rims. And I think that's that that tells a lot about you know the restoration job itself, and of course the condition of the bike prior to restoration. What I thought was interesting in the description was that he said he had traded this bike for a pristine Harley 250 MX which I'm certain if it was a Harley pristine, in pristine condition, uh, the price of that would far exceed a 70, 78 or a 79 YZ 250. So uh, yeah. I, I, don't know, I don't know about the balance there, but what do you think about that? Well, I don't think it would be a good straight across trade at all. We either got part of the story or maybe the story about the trade wasn't really true. Mm. Nonetheless, the, the YZ is a nine out of 10. And um, I think the market did a pretty good job valuing the bike. Although I believe this might've been a buy it now yeah. price rather than a uh, an active bidding price. So uh, somebody stepped up at 5,900. I think they got a pretty good deal. I, I, I think they did too. Uh, I think the seller came up a little short at 5,900, but I certainly know from experience that if you were to go out and buy that bike in uh, in the condition that it would be worthy of restoration, you'd probably pay a couple of thousand dollars for it. And then by the time you just went out and bought parts and did some things with outside services, you, you'd be in, you know, 2000 for the bike and at least another 3000 in parts and outside services. So I think the buyer did very well. I think the seller came up a little short. Yeah, perhaps. Um, uh, I can't imagine the seller being unhappy with the deal. No. No. Well, Bill, it's another one in the books. I want to thank you for joining me today. Terrific. Good to be here. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, Bill Mashnow, for your input on that YZ250 that we just took a look at. We'll be back with another segment next week, uh, and we'll have Bill Mashnow back with us. Right now, we're going to be talking about our next segment of the 522 Project. This, of course, is a replica we're building uh, of a 1974 Honda RC125. This week, we're going to be talking about the swing arm, 
And Jordan, if you'll uh, roll the tape, we'll get a look at what's happening here. While the length of the swing arm and of course the width were correct for our project, there really wasn't too much else that was perfectly correct about it. We had to remove the original shock mounts from this 74 swing arm. We replaced it, we put in some bushings like this here that are threaded, so we'll now have the correct way to mount our chain adjusters. Also, we took the 1977 style shock mount and we mounted it further up on the 74 swing arm. We had these gussets made, we had it all welded together. Uh, it was all done by Daryl Dickerson from Current Fabrication in Tracy, California. We were also um, aware of where the brake arm, the torque arm would have to go for the bike that we're trying to replicate. So we made sure that that was put in as well and also followed up with where our chain guide will be going toward the back of the swing arm. An early RC125 swing arm was more tubular like this one, more like a pipe style. As time went on, they did get more rectangular, um, but the early, the early bike, the early RC125, 1974 swing arm did look very, very similar to this. And that's what we had to do in order to get this project to look as authentic as possible. Jordan, great job on the editing. I hope everyone enjoyed that segment of our uh, 522 project. I do have the swing arm right here. And next week, we'll be bringing you another segment on the next part of that project. I don't know what it's going to be yet. There's so many things going on with it. I'm going to bring you something that's very, very interesting that you can count on. Again, Jordan, thanks for the great job on the editing. And I hope everyone enjoyed it. Product Spotlight. What do we got going on here tonight, Jordan? Preston Petty, of course. We are a authorized dealer for Preston Petty products. You can go to their website, Preston Petty products. They're on Facebook, they're on Instagram. Of course, you can join them on their website. This week, our special is a free pair of Works GP grips with any order over $25.95. They come in black, they come in red. You go over to the Preston Petty website, order what you need. But in order to get that special, you have to inbox me for the code. Inbox me for the code. When you're checking out, you're going to put the code in there. You put it in there, you're going to get your free set of grips when you check out at Preston Petty Products. Tomorrow, I will put on the website here, on Vintage Motocross q and I'll put that there is a special. What I've been doing is posting something like that, saying that there's a special, describing it. And in the bottom, I suggest that you, in the comments, put in, send me the code. When you do that, I'll send you the code in a private message. Go over to the Preston Petty website, score yourself a set of free GP grips with any order over $25.95. Thank you, Paul Standard and Patty, everyone over at Preston Petty Products. Vinco, keep the ride going. A lot of guys out there riding 360 Makos, 68, 69, 400s, the 70 uh, through the 81, 440s, and so on. They've got a connecting rod kit that can't be beat for 179 bucks. Why fool around? with pressing cranks in, pressing cranks out, and going through all that, when you can go over to Vinco, and for just $179.95, you can get everything you need to install that thing with confidence, knowing you're getting a quality part that exceeds OEM standards. You've got a heavy-duty forged steel connecting rod. You get the crank pin, the big end bearing, the wrist pin, the thrust washers. There's nothing you could ask for, nothing more you're going to need, and nobody's going to give it to you better than Vinco. I want to thank them for being a sponsor of Vintage Motocross Q&A. Let's take a look at that Vinco commercial while we're, while we're talking about Vinco. Classic and vintage dirt bikes are more than a hobby. It's not just about the ride. It's about the work that goes in. The work that keeps you connected to the ride. It's about bringing the bike back to life and doing it with your own hands. It's about the adrenaline and adventure. And when it comes to putting all the pieces together, only Vinco knows the bikes and parts the way you do. Vinco, keep the ride going. Vinco.com, 
keep the ride going. You really ought to go check out Vintgo.com. Over 650 items in their catalog. I'm more than sure they have something that you're going to be looking for. Thank you, Kurt Leverton, Jay Clark, and everybody at Vinco for helping out here with the show. Susie tells me that nobody has shared the show and that we don't have a winner for this amazing miracle wash from Amsoil. Nobody shared the show? Come on, guys. Well, I'll save it for next week. Whoever, uh, maybe whoever shares it during the week, I'll pick somebody out. So many people do support the show and share it so much. Guys like Joe Anderson, Lee Falabam, uh, Sal Scarpa, Sam Floridia, and so many more, Mark Brown. So maybe during the week, I'll, uh, I'll see who has shared the show the most and uh, we'll contact them. We'll put it up on the uh, Vintage Motocross Q&A page and I'll let you know who won the, uh, the bike wash, the miracle wash from Amsoil. Announcements, Jordan, what do we got tonight? VMX Radio. If you've been uh, listening to our, our show on Sunday, it's been going great. We've had so many wonderful uh, interviews going on. Last week, we had, uh, we had Scott Wallenberg. We've had Garrett Walsh. We've had so many. And I think we've got a little clip here of the, uh, of the Scott Wallenberg interview from last week. Jordan, let it rip. I was so fortunate. I got to ride nine out of 11 Trans AMAs in 76. And um, of the nine of 11 that I rode, seven out of nine were mudders. Ohio was muddy, Unadilla. I got to ride Unadilla in the grass, uh, Axton, Virginia, muddy. Um, St. Peter's, Missouri, incredible mud. Rabbit Run, Texas. The only ones that were dry was Phoenix. I remember Phoenix was dry. And Sears Point, which was... That scared the heck out of me, honestly. I, I've i never been so terrified on a motocross track as that. Because Why? I'd never experienced those kind of hills before. We asked Harley for four months, could we test this bike for the magazine, Cycle Times? No, no, no. Finally, they relented in the mid, mid-summer of 75. And Eric Scrudlin and I were brought out to this track. We're at a secret test session with my dad, a photographer, Mark Thompson, and Harley Guy, and me and Eric. And we rode the bikes. And I got to tell you, they were impressive for us. One, they had long traveled. Yes, they had the forks in the back. We hadn't seen them before. Nobody tried them. Everybody was experimenting at that time with all sorts of things. And I really don't know why they get such a bad rep about it. People look at it and go, well, that can't be right. And that, but that was not the problem with the bike at all. In my opinion, they were a little bit heavier, mm-hmm. but the bikes that we rode at first, these were champion frames. We had the Chayaba forks with the canisters on it. I mean, these were factory prepared bikes. They were very nice. And now the question was, what is Harley going to do next? Scott Wallenberg giving us the real skinny on so many things, including the Harley 250 MX. You can listen to the Scott Wallenberg video at any time at Vintage Motocross Radio. I want to thank Scott Wallenberg for being my guest last week. My guest this Sunday is a multi-time overall winner of the Baja 500 and the Baja 1000. He's ridden raid rallies in North Africa, including the car. He's a, a, a branding genius when it comes to off-road motorcycles. He's helped Husqvarna, BMW, KTM, and, and so many more. He's also in the AMA Hall of Fame. It's going to be hard to get everything in in one hour with this guy. I can't wait for Sunday at 11 a.m. when I welcome my guest, Scott Harden. Scott Harden will be joining us this Sunday at 11 a.m. on Vintage Motocross Radio. I want to wish my dear friend Brad Lackey a happy birthday today. Brad Lackey, 67 laps around the sun. Not bad, champ. 67 laps, huh? I'll see you Saturday. We'll, uh, we'll solve some problems. Happy birthday, 1982 world champion, Brad Lackey. Marty Smith decal sheets are still available for my friend Rich Vassallo. You can reach out to Rich at USA1899 at AOL.com. He also takes Venmo. I don't know how much longer they're going to be printing these Marty Smith commemorative decals, but you should get some while they last. 
They're from Rick Designs. Uh, Wally Hackensmith also gave some of the artwork. And uh, for 20 bucks, you can get some, stick them on your toolbox, get two sets, put some on your toolbox, maybe on your truck, and uh, maybe frame a set in remembrance of the great Marty Smith. We do have a winner. Hold up there, Jordan, stay with the t-shirt thing. But I do want to announce a winner. Mike Hudgens shared it 11 times, shared the show 11 times. Mike Hudgens, send us your address. I'm going to get you some Miracle Wash compliments of Amsoil. Sue came in here before waving her hands like the place is on fire. She's like, no, we don't have a winner yet. Yes, we do have a winner. Mike Hudgens, you shared it like 11 times. Mike, I want to thank you. Get us your address. We'll get you a can of that out to you right away. Jordan and his t-shirt venture is going really, really well. $21.95 gets you a Vintage Motocross Q&A t-shirt. Really quality cotton too. It's made from Hanes and the logo looks really cool. A couple of people have brought them already. You can go over to, uh, well, the link is actually in the description of the show. So it's got the logo on the front. It's got some writing on the back too. Some people have purchased them already. I'm going to be starting a little album section of the show um, so that people can send in their picture, wearing the shirt. We'll be able to uh, put it in there and show you in that album. In this picture right here is Dino Dave Woodworth. That's Jordan's dad, he's wearing the shirt. So Dave Woodworth purchased the shirt and showed a few other people. Uh, Dave is an avid Mako writer, much like his boy, Jordan. So if you wanna get over there, get a shirt, 22 bucks. I think it's a great deal. Support Vintage Motocross Q&A, it's a quality shirt. And uh, we would appreciate if you purchase a shirt for our show. FastGuyStuff.com supplying us with stickers every week for the Vintage Motocross or the Vintage Moto Showcase. I want to thank Sean Gomes and everyone over at FastGuyStuff.com for uh, all their support and the great stickers they've supplied us with over the years or over the months. I don't think we've been here for years, although I've done a lot of shows. Is that it, Jordan? Is that all we got going on tonight? Oh, sponsorship opportunities are still available. You know what? Because of the COVID-19 thing, you should really contact me. Because I'm going to cut some rates on a few things for some people. If you're new and you want to go into, uh, you know, maybe you don't want to go into something as big as Vinco did or Amsoil was doing. Maybe you want to do something a little bit smaller. I like to put a special deal together for some people. Contact me. I'll get you a proposal and we'll put you on the air here. You'll get some of the benefits, the same things that Vinco is seeing, Amsoil, Preston Petty Products, and of course, FastGuyStuff.com. I want to thank everybody for watching tonight. Jordan, for doing such a great job with everything. And I think this is the part where the dog steals the show. Gio, come on, boy. Oh, there he goes. There you go. Thanks, everybody, for watching Vintage Motocross q and Don't forget to tune in on Sunday at 11 a.m. The Vintage Pro Motocross Radio with my Scott. My, my guest will be Scott Harden. We'll see you then. <laughs>